He's not exactly a doppelganger, but to the casual observer, he's a good enough likeness. He looks like Jamal Khashoggi. Today, new stills of the dead Saudi journalist leaked to Turkish state TV show him entering the consulate premises, from which a pro-government paper now reports four calls were made to the Saudi Crown Prince's office that fateful day, October the 2nd. It's more drip-fed, uncorroboratable intelligence, but it sent Riyadh into a panic. Now, compare and contrast. Same clothes, same glasses, same beard, same age and build. Everything but the shoes. A senior Turkish official told CNN today this man was a body double. Mustafa al is his name, they reported. He's apparently one of the 15-strong Saudi assassination squad. Here, he's caught on CCTV arriving at the consulate wearing a checked shirt and jeans at 3 minutes past 11 a.m. He's with an accomplice. Two hours later, Kasogji arrives. Within the hour, he'd be dead. The doppelganger slips out the back with his sidekick and takes a cab to Istanbul's famed Sultan Ahmed Mosque, a big tourist attraction. They head to the Louvre plastic bag in the accomplice's hand. When they emerge, Mr. Almadani's back in his own clothes again. Next sighting, a restaurant. Now Almadani's got rid of his goatee beard too. Then, mission almost accomplished. They ditch the plastic bag thought to have contained the dead journalist's clothes. Job done. Back at their hotel, the two men look relaxed. Their relief would prove short-lived. With the Saudi spin on this having been a rogue operation gone wrong, all unravelling fast, the Prime Minister today condemned Khashoggi's killing. I am sure the whole House will join me in condemning the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in the strongest possible terms. We must get to the truth of what happened. Tomorrow, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman hosts the once vaunted investment conference, dubbed Davos in the Desert except now VIP invitees have deserted in droves. Tuesday promises to be a big day for young prince not so charming. He'll be bracing for this man, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, delivering what he's called the naked truth. Will his bombshell be those elusive audio tapes that could incriminate the heir to the throne of the royal house of Saud? It's already hard to conclude that Kasogji's brutal execution was not the premeditated, cold-blooded murder it looks like. Erdogan will want to serve his revenge dish up cold, and he'll relish this. Humiliating Saudi Arabia, Turkey's great regional rival, in front of a horrified world and over Jamal Kasogji's dead body. Well, we're joined now by the writer and historian Robert Lacey, who was one of Jamal Khashoggi's closest friends. Why don't we just start talking about him before we talk about the events? I mean, who was the man, Khashoggi? He was a journalist all his life, from uh, when I first met him in the 70s, 80s. He was about to go off to Afghanistan. That, of course, famously was where he reported on Osama bin Laden as a hero, as he was for us in the West in those days. And then I met him again in this century when he came over as an advisor to Prince Toki, the uh, Saudi ambassador. You've got that picture of him there. Um, he was always called Uncle Jamal, hmm. that's what people called him. And we used to meet always in the Wolseley Cafe in London, which was a opened, it used to be a motor car showroom. It was converted into a restaurant in the year that he came to London. So that's where we sat and had our scrambled eggs. He's a pretty bulky gentleman. But what was his... I mean, he clearly was seen by Prince Salman as a critic, a dangerous critic. Um, what was it that he disliked about the prince? Um, Jamal felt, and I agree with him, that um, this new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, had changed the operations of power in Saudi Arabia. Until he came along, one could always say, look, it's a collective... There are right-wingers, left-wingers. It's not as... It, it, it wasn't totally overwhelming. This man is um, an absolutist. He's got total power and control. Mm. 
So the idea that um, he knew nothing at all about what happened in Turkey with two private planes flying 16 Saudi agents to deal with this and then fly out again. It, it's difficult to believe that he didn't know what was going on. Right. Well, now, I mean, the ramifications are extraordinary. The Saudis can never have known themselves, I mean, to be in such a grievous position in terms of the absolute despair of the Western alliance about what's gone on. Well, forgive me if I smile wryly. Um, I mean, I've been speaking to people in Riyadh today. This man is as popular as ever because... The prince. The prince. prince. Because whatever he may or may not have done outside Saudi Arabia, for them, he has delivered. A Washington Post reporter went outside a cinema a couple of nights back in Riyadh. He interviewed 30 Saudis. Not one would say a word against the crown prince. Now, there is fear in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's part of it. But they all said, look, this cinema didn't exist a year ago. I couldn't sit with my wife and children and enjoy popcorn and this movie. They were watching the Claire Foy movie about the man on the moon. And my daughter's got her driving licence. But that's what's so bizarre. You get the reform on the one level, and we all celebrated women driving, etc. And underneath, you have this gruesome preparedness to kill. Yes. Um, uh, there is social reform, yes. There is some degree of economic reform, but the man is totally indifferent to political reform, and at the moment, at home, the Saudis are buying it. Um, Britain uh, and our position with the oil. Yes. I mean, of course, we're powerless to do anything. Well, that, that's also why I smiled wryly. Um, and the at, weapons, incidentally. At, at home, he is popular, and when it comes to abroad, People, I'm afraid, will still do business. I mean, whatever you think of Trump, he has been totally honest about this. He says, I've, it's very sad what's happened to this man, and he's not even prepared to let the crown prince off the hook as being responsible. But he says, look, I've got an arms industry. I've got 10, 20, 30,000 workers. I'm not going to put them out of work because of this. And I think, at the end of the day, all other Western countries are going to say the same.